presenters. Welcome everyone and good morning from Washington, D.C. I'm Kaylin Crockett, Special Assistant in the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We're thrilled to co-host this webinar with the Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women. Most of you know that April is National Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. It's an important annual reminder of the far too prevalent incidence of sexual violence, which can include a range of non-consensual sexual acts, from forced touching to coercive intercourse to forced penetration. Today's webinar was organized to shed greater light on the frequently invisible, yet staggeringly common, experiences of sexual violence amongst persons with disabilities. You will hear from expert speakers doing groundbreaking work across the country to raise awareness, improve access to justice and victim services, and build partnerships across systems for survivors with disabilities. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Amy Loader, Associate Director in the Office of Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice. Welcome, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Um, as that, as uh, Caitlin said, my name is Amy Loder. I'm an Associate Director at the Office on Violence Against Women. And I just want to provide a really brief overview about some of the work that OBW has done to address um, uh, violence and abuse of uh, people with disabilities and deaf individuals. We have a number of grant programs, but we have um, one grant program that specifically focuses on addressing um, domestic violence, sexual violence, dating violence, and stalking against people with disabilities and deaf individuals, and that's the Training and Services to End Violence Against Women with uh, Disabilities Grant Program, or the Disability Grant Program for short. Um, it's a relatively new grant program, and it's, and it's fairly small. Um, it's, about, it's authorized for about $6 million, and it was created um, by the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2002. We fund uh, states, units of local government, tribal governments, tribal organizations, and victim service providers, which include domestic violence programs and shelters, rape crisis centers, um, either domestic violence, sexual assault, or dual state coalitions, and disability organizations. I think it's pretty fair to say that um, when the disability grant program was created, disability was a really new issue to OVW and I think new to the field. Not that it was new, that violence and abuse against people with disabilities was new, um, but that it was not something that we necessarily addressed on a regular basis. And I think it's pretty fair to say that disability organizations didn't see OVW as a resource either. In fact, they probably um, had never heard of the Office on Violence Against Women. Um, so as a result, the office made a conscious decision to structure the grant program um, in a really particular way. Um, and we did so with quite a bit of input, both from um, the Violence Against Women field, but also from disability and deaf organizations as well. Um, so the structure of the grant program is that they are three years award, uh, three year awards. They have a planning and a development period and an implementation period, and we have a, a partnership acquire, uh, requirement, and we ensure that the partnerships of e are equal. So we require that at least one victim service organization and one disability organization um, apply to establish multidisciplinary collaborative teams. The focus is on building the capacity of all of the, um, all the partner organizations, um, building their capacity to be able to provide services safely and appropriately to people with disabilities. Um, we focus on the organization itself and not individual staff members. Um, <clears throat> so we really look at, um, look at access issues within, uh, within the organizations but also a victim-centered approach, so that regardless of where um, um, a survivor with a disability enters into, um, enters into contact with a victim service uh, provider, 
they are ensured that they get an appropriate and safe response. And we really focus on um, examining the policies, the practices, the knowledge, the outreach, and the budgeting of the organizations. Since about 2002, we have supported approximately 60 to 65 unduplicated projects, which um, you know really is quite a bit, um, quite a lot of communities that we've been able to support. As I said before, the disability uh, grant program is relatively small. It's been appropriated um, anywhere from 5.7 to six million dollars a year. We're only able to support anywhere from nine to about 12 communities per year. Um, so we're really pleased with what we've been able to do. Um, I think that we have developed quite um, a, a network of collaborative teams across the country um, that are currently safely and appropriately responding to survivors with disabilities. And in many of those projects, they continue the work without um, receiving additional funding from our from our um, from our office. And I think that you know the reason that they're able to do so is because we actually do focus on the organizations so that the work of providing services to people with disabilities becomes a fabric of the organization itself and not just a project or a temporary add-on. Um, and then I think what's really exciting too is that um, many of the projects that we've supported have taken the lessons that they have learned through the disability grant program and they've actually infused disability into other projects um, that are not supported by the dis disability grant program or even through our office ourselves. Um, you know, so one of the grantees that we have today who I'm going to introduce very briefly um, is called Illinois Imagined. Um, it is the Department of Human Services is the direct recipient and they have about six or seven different partners. Um, they are a statewide project that focuses on physical, intellectual disabilities and mental health. Um, they have also been able to uh, provide very similar work um, through a, a project that focuses on domestic violence. Um, Teresa Tudor is going to go into a lot more depth about um, what sort of the, the framework of the grant program looks like when you put it into practice. Um, and they've also been able to infuse disability into other work that they have. So I'm going to let her do all of the specifics about that, but I wanted to give you a brief overview. Now I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining this webinar. We're really excited. Uh, I'm hearing some feedback. Are you also hearing some feedback? Everyone make sure that their computer speakers are muted, please. Well, I'll keep going even though there is that feedback. Hopefully it's not a problem for others. But um, again, I want to thank all of you for joining this webinar on this very important topic. Um, and I also want to thank OVW for um, asking us to participate. In, in this webinar, um, we um, do find I think this topic is very important, uh, given what we know about people with developmental disabilities and the fact that they are at greater risk for abuse and neglect, including sexual abuse. And we also know that when this occurs, it's likely not to be addressed in the judicial system. Um, for a variety of reasons, and more needs to be done to ensure this doesn't continue, and that individuals with developmental disabilities have their rights protected. Um, so again, we're very glad to be a part of this and to um, raise awareness not only about this issue, but also to give an opportunity to hear more about work being done in this area. Um, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities uh, has been addressing this issue in a variety of ways, most importantly through the work of our grantees. AIDD is a part of the Administration for Community Living, which also includes the Administration on Aging, the Center for Integrated Programs, and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. 
of the offices and programs within the administration for community living is working towards our mission, which is to maximize the independence, well-being, and health of older adults people and people with disabilities across the lifespan and their families and caregivers. Uh, and so this topic of um, sexual abuse um, is a topic that really does cut across both the aging and disability populations. And while we're focusing on that on disabilities today, um, again, it is a topic that we do work across the agency on. Within the Administration on Disabilities, we fund a number of programs, as I mentioned earlier, that really do the work at the state and local level on this topic. Um, our programs uh, really operate uh, based on shared principles that people with developmental and other significant disabilities should live independent lives um, and lead those lives in a self-determined way. Um, they also, we also believe that uh, people uh, should have their rights protected um, and should have the same rights as anyone else um, to live life in the community and that they have the right to carry out the, you know, to be responsible citizens just like everyone else. Um, we also, uh, and our programs also operate under the principle of community integration and active participation that people with disabilities should be a part of the community um, and active uh, participants in meaningful ways in a variety of ways, whether it's in the school setting, um, in the church, in the community, uh, in, in different aspects, they should be um, included in all aspects of that. Um, and finally, our, our office and our programs operate under the principle that people with developmental disabilities and other significant disabilities should lead productive lives um, and that they are able to support their own economic well-being by having uh, jobs that uh, earn wages just like everyone else. Uh, so we, we accomplish all of this through the work of our programs. Uh, within the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, or AIDD, we fund what are called State Councils on Developmental Disabilities, and we have 56 of these in each state and territory. State Protection and Advocacy Systems, and we have 57 of those in each state and territory, uh, and one for the Native American community. And then we have 68 University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Uh, also within the Administration on Disabilities, we fund um, independent living services, which, are, um, su which support statewide independent living councils, and we also fund um, just over 350 centers for independent living in the states and territories. Um, so again, the, our grantees uh, carry out work uh, related to sexual abuse in a variety of ways, and we do have grantees on the call today. Um, uh, our PNA from Illinois is presenting, uh, and um, our USAID from Illinois is pre presenting, and they're going to give more information about the projects that they're working on, but I just wanted to give you some flavor of other work that our grantees are doing. Um, as an example, our PNA in uh, Protection and Advocacy Agency in Kentucky has been participating in what is called Project SAFE. It stands for Safe and Accessibility for Everyone. And this is a multidisciplinary network that is working to build the capacity of professionals throughout Kentucky to provide safe and accessible and comprehensive person-centered services uh, to individuals uh, with disabilities who have been subjected to sexual assault um, or abuse. Um, so that's work that they are doing. Um, in Missouri, our grantees, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, the Protection and Advocacy Agency, and the University Center have collaborated to explore and research existing information regarding sexual, physical, and um, fiscal victimization of people with developmental disabilities. And through this work, uh, the University Center there is developing an iPhone and iPad app uh, that is on self-determination and sexual abuse to help to give people with developmental disabilities tools if they are to experience sexual abuse and can raise that um, as an issue to, to, to people who can help to address that. 
And then um, similarly in Utah, our three programs there are collaborating to develop a training curriculum for uh, direct support professionals and other individuals um, such as first responders on how to address sexual abuse uh, if they are presented with an individual with developmental disabilities who has been abused sexually. So that's just, again, a, a flavor of some of the work that our grantees are doing um, in this area. And again, you'll hear more about that from um, two of our grantees. Um, in addition to that work, uh, AIDD has collaborated uh, with the Administration for Children and Families. You may be aware, aware that they have work that is focused on trafficking. Um, which includes sex trafficking, and we are aware that there are group homes uh, where people with developmental disabilities live that have weak controls um, over the group home, so they are targets for sex trafficking. So we have been collaborating with them on how to better address the needs of people with developmental disabilities when it comes to trafficking and sex trafficking. Um, we are also working, I mentioned earlier that um, sexual abuse is really uh, not only a disability issue, but it's also an aging issue. And so we have been working uh, with our uh, Office of Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program here in ACL. Um, and, you know, the, as I mentioned, this is not only a disability issue, but um, also an issue for the aging community and people living in nursing homes where um, many people with developmental disabilities are li living even though they may not be um, there because they're elderly and need care, but because uh, that's the only option in terms of uh, providing services and supports for them. Um, and so nursing homes have a tendency to, unfortunately, be a place where there is increased incidence of sexual abuse. And you may be aware of um, national attention brought to this issue uh, okay. through stories in CNN. Um, so we're just coordinating with them to be able to address those specific issues that are going on within, within nursing homes. So I am going to turn it over now um, to our next presenter. But I again want to thank everyone for being on this webinar today and for uh, the people who are presenting today. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for that great and rich overview of the work that the Administration for Community Living does for survivors of abuse of all abilities and across the lifespan. Before our next presenters uh, discuss the incredible work they're doing on the ground on these issues, we wanted to provide a snapshot of what the data tells us about the experiences of persons with disabilities uh, who um, have been victimized. We uh, wanted to show you first uh, this chart on the right of the slide here um, is an illustration of the three times greater frequency that persons with disabilities experience violent crimes compared to the general population without disabilities. Uh, this includes sexual assault, but also other non-fatal violent acts, such as phys physical assaults and robbery. And uh, it's it's information that is collected by the Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics um, and as recently as November 2016. The key takeaways from the data that we're presenting to you that is of particular relevance to advocacy and your work on the ground, ground is uh, the following. First, persons with disabilities experience sexual assault more than three times the rate of persons without a disability. And these rates hold true earlier in the lifespan, with children with disabilities three times more likely to be sexually abused. Second, most perpetrators of sexual assault are known to the survivor. And persons with disabilities experience sexual violence in a relationship at rates comparable to persons without disabilities. 14%, um, or rather it's uh, the perpetrator of a sexual assault that uh, is experienced by a person with disability, 14% of the time is a boyfriend or girlfriend. And while persons with disabilities experience sexual assault at rates higher than persons without disabilities, the general population without a disability experiences uh, sexual violence in a relationship uh, with the perpetrator of sexual assault 
13% of the time being their boyfriend or girlfriend. Thirdly, persons with multiple disabilities, such as intellectual and physical disabilities, experience sexual assault at the highest rates, and children with an intellectual disability experience sexual abuse at rates almost five times higher than children without disabilities. We also have a serious challenge with underreporting. In the general population uh, of survivors experience violence, Without a disability, this is a huge issue uh, for reasons such as stigma uh, around victim blaming, not wanting to um, get their um, perpetrator in trouble, oftentimes because it's occurring in an intimate partner relationship, um, and other challenges. Um, these challenges and more exist for survivors with disabilities. And Amy is going to go into some of those reasons, um, challenges that we have with underreporting of sexual violence among persons with disabilities, as well as other challenges that survivors with disabilities encounter in seeking help for sexual assault. So a, a big takeaway is that while persons with disabilities experience sexual assault at rates far greater than the general population, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what we know because of some of the challenges that Amy is going to next illuminate for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Caitlin. And I think that you did um, a, a very nice sort of uh, broad brush of sort of the prevalence of, of abuse of people with disabilities. Um, you know, and I think that one of the biggest challenges, um, and I, I want to talk about victim service providers, and when I say that I mean um, really uh, service providers who are working in the area of sexual um, assault and, and domestic violence, and then also with um, service providers in disability organizations, but that, um, you know, I think a, a big problem is, is that there really um, is a lack of understanding of the problem. So, you know, victim service providers aren't seeing a lot of people with disabilities coming in and using their services. They're not being trained. Um, on disability or the prevalence of violence against people with disabilities. Um, you know, and a lot of the times um, the victim service providers, they're providing services. They are busy um, uh, doing advocacy work and providing supportive services. Um, they're most likely not up to date on available research. And I think that, um, you know, the research on violence against people with disabilities um, is fairly limited. Um, you know, and I think, too, that there um, is a challenge about not knowing exactly what it looks like. Um, so, you know, I think that victim service providers have a very clear idea about what, um, you know, in this case, sexual violence looks like, um, but they might not see some of the other types of, um, types of acts that could be considered to be abusive, such as, you know, inappropriate or rough touching during um, bathing or toileting or, um, you know, not necessarily sexual violence related, but withholding uh, medication or separating an individual from either a mobility device or a service animal. Um, you know, without the proper training, they wouldn't necessarily identify that as being um, a tactic of violence and abuse. In many um, victim service organizations, there's a lack of access. Um, you know, and I think that access, you know, you're looking at the physical access, so the building might not be accessible. Um, the shelter space or the shelter rooms might not be accessible. Um, but even, um, you know, if you can get into the building, it could be that the areas where they held uh, the support groups or the counseling, um, they may not be able to get to, um, get to the room to receive those services. Um, I think a big issue with victim service providers is how people actually access services, which is typically um, through a hotline. Um, you know, and this can be incredibly challenging if an individual is deaf or if they have a disability um, that impacts their speech. So that can be a big barrier to actually accessing services. Um, you know, policies, um, they, uh, many of them unintentionally create, um, um, you know, a barrier to help seeking. Um, so it could be that a program has a policy of no guests. 
guest. Well, a guest could be a personal care attendant. And if you are an individual who depends upon your personal care attendant, but that organization is saying that um, they may not come to assist you, then that person's not going to be able to receive services. Um, the same can be tr said of um, service animals. You know, and there's there are some um, uh, locations about a confidential location, so not wanting to drop off in front of the shelter. They may require that people get dropped off um, around the corner or down the street. Um, and that might not always be uh, uh, possible or an option um, for everyone. And again, I think that um, one of the biggest barriers to a lack of training and understanding the problem is that very well may result in an unwelcoming attitude of staff um, and also a lack of comfort in um, addressing um, violence and abuse against people with disabilities because people are just unaware and unfamiliar um, interacting with people with disabilities. In terms of outreach, um, you know, not, um, not all victim service organizations are actually going to where people with disabilities are. It's not, they're not engaging um, in targeted outreach efforts. Um, the materials that they may use um, may not uh, reflect people with disabilities or demonstrate that the organization knows, uh, knows and understands um, abuse of people with disabilities and their experiences. So some of the tactics that I referred to earlier, those um, might not specifically be outlined in any type of outreach materials or any community um, events that they might hold. You know, so the materials, um, you know, things that would make it accessible would actually showing a person with a disability or having the handicap symbol or the symbol um, uh, indicating that ASL interpreters um, uh, were available. You know, and then again, finally, services. If, service, if, uh, if victim service providers don't have the training, they don't have the education, and they don't have the policies that guide their practices, services will not be accessible. Um, you know, people with disabilities won't be able to join support groups. Um, I think that advocates, you know, if they don't have that, um, that education, they're not necessarily going to be comfortable um, advocating for a person with a disability during a forensic exam. So how will they be able to ensure that a person understands fully what is happening to them or what is about to happen to them? Um, to, um, they're not going to have the information that's needed to ensure that an exam is being conducted um, so that the person isn't being um, physically harmed even more than they, they might already be. Um, advocates may not uh, fully understand guardianship implications or even if a person has a guardian. Um, you know, and then finally, I think that there are, um, you know, the issue of what if a person uses a, a mobility device or a communication device and that is actually um, being used as evidence. Um, so those are some of the challenges um, that, pe that people with disabilities might run into um, in terms of reaching out to victim service providers. I think that there are also some within disability organizations as well. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that that it's the understanding the scope of the problem, I think that it's very similar to um, victim service providers. I don't think um, what, what we have seen is that they're not receiving um, training on sexual violence, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, um, nor are they receiving training on how to uh, respond, you know, in a, in a safe and confidential and um, victim-centered way. Um, you know, disability organizations, they may see that responding um, to disclosures of domestic and sexual violence is not their job. You know, a lot of disability organizations really focus on ensuring that their clients have health care and, and housing and employment um, benefits and, and, you know, have the ability to live as independently as possible. Um, you know, they're not seeing that domestic and sexual violence as being a core part of their job. And, you know, what we have seen is that when it does come up, um, typically the response is to make a report with the appropriate state um, authority and um, not necessarily responding in a victim-centered way or possibly passing on a, re on a referral. 
I think that, you know, a lot of these um, issues really could be solved um, if there was a relationship between victim service organizations um, and disability and deaf organizations. You know, I sort of alluded to it in the beginning, but, but you know, when I said that when the disability grant program came into being and it was new to us, I mean, it really was. There is not a long and rich history of victim service providers and disability organizations working together. They might have known that they existed within the community. Um, you know, in some cases, they absolutely did not know. Um, you know, so they didn't, they weren't aware of each other's work, they weren't um, having those collaborative working relationships, you know, and they really didn't have the benefit of informing each other's work. Um, you know, I think that the criminal justice system is um, a very different set of barriers. I do think that there is a lack of understanding of the scope of the problem and certainly lack of um, uh, training um, for the criminal justice system in, in general, but I think that a couple of things that come up is that um, people with disabilities may be, um, may be seen as lacking credibility, um, either from law enforcement or prosecution, um, you know, especially if the person has an intellectual disability or if their disability makes communication um, challenging, you know, something that's very much so along those lines is that an individual with disabilities, um, you know, are seen um, in some cases as poor witnesses, um, you know, just for the reasons that I, I stated, um, you know, I think another piece when it comes to sexual violence is that, um, you know, many people um, see individuals with disabilities as non-sexual beings, and so I think that that um, sort of bias that we have in society um, is a very large uh, barrier within the criminal justice system and, and, and outside of the criminal justice system as well. Um, you know, and I think too, as Caitlin um, stated before, people with, uh, with disabilities, um, they experience multiple victimizations throughout their life. Um, you know, and as she stated, it starts at a very young age. Um, and it is not unusual for people with disabilities to have um, multiple incidents and multiple perpetrators. So when an officer or a prosecutor might be talking about an incident that is happening in real time, um, you know, it is, uh, you know, quite possible that um, a person might be talking about all of their prior victimizations because you're talking about multiple um, traumas that they have sustained over um, their life, their lifetime. So, you know, I also think that um, two other things that I want to want to touch on is that, you know, people with disabilities, I think um, that there are, um, that there's definitely a lack of education for people with disabilities about healthy relationships and boundaries and about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Um, you know, and I think that a big barrier, whether we're talking about victim services or disabilities or, or um, disability organizations or the criminal justice system, is that when, when being um, attempts to educate staff and to make services more um, accessible and victim-centered for them um, is that people with disabilities are not always included um, in that process. So by not creating, uh, by not including them in these processes, um, you know, that actually does kind of create a, a barrier for them as well. So, you know, as I said before, we have our grantee, Teresa Tudor, with the Illinois Imagines um, Collaborative, who I think can really um, touch upon each of these challenges um, in much greater detail and sort of um, um, provide the solutions that their <coughs> team has done to address some of these. So I would like to, to stop my talking and, uh, and let the, the um, grantees of OVW and, and, and um, um, HHS to, to really talk about what they're doing because they're, they're the ones that are, that are actually providing the solutions to these issues. So I will turn it over. So when we were first funded in 2006, 
Um, as Amy mentioned earlier, part of the requirement um, of a grantee is to go through a planning process. And it was through that planning process that we came up with the um, project name, Illinois Imagines. And that really comes from a value of wanting to um, take this to the next level and imagine what services might be like, what Illinois might be like for people with disabilities. You know, of course, prevention would be the ultimate goal, um, but realistically looking at our current service system, that being the disability service system as well as victim services, and really look at things in a new lens, not the way we've always been doing it, although there was great service going on, but to be open to look at our own organizations and imagine how it could be different from the lens or the experience of a victim with a disability. And that's really a key part. I'm just sharing a, a picture that happened a couple of years ago at our self-advocate statewide conference and some of the women that came together to share, um, it, not just share in terms of presenting at workshops, but also to create some messages um, in the form of a video to teach victim service providers and disability service providers what they need to know in order to do a better job at responding to violence against people with disabilities. And self-advocates have truly been at the, the front and center from the very beginning, and I think that's a key point. Oftentimes we bring um, you know, victims in at the focus group level, but they're actually as a part of our planning team, our training team, all of those things. But to, to back up one moment um, to give you an idea when Amy said that we had several providers, um, we've gone beyond one victim service provider and one disability service provider and have a whole host because we truly are looking at and continue to strive towards statewide systems change. And to do that, you need to bring together the systems that make a difference in the day-to-day -day work and the day-to-day -day experience of uh, survivors of sexual violence. And so, as Amy mentioned, I'm with the Illinois Department of Human Services, and we actually have three divisions that um, provide disability services, the Division of Mental Health, the Division of Rehab Services, and the Division of Developmental Disabilities. We also house victim services, sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking within the Department of Human Services. And as you can see, we're partnering with the coalition, we're partnering with the with the SILs, our uh, um, Illinois Network for Centers of Independent Living have 23 SILs across the state. We also partner with the Illinois Family Violence Coordinating Council, which runs through the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, which receives a lot of the federal funding that's available uh, to address violence. And so it's important to have them as a partner at the table. The Alliance is a self-advocacy alliance. It's groups across the state of Illinois uh, filled with self-advocates that are leaders and making a difference uh, not only in their communities but at the state level. Blue Tower Solutions, which is a, um, an organization that has a long history of working with disability service providers around and self-advocates around leadership um, as well as violence. <laughs> and Adult Protective Services, which is housed in our Department on Aging. And that has uh, uh, been a more recent partner um, as they took on responsibility for responding to mandatory reporting of violence against people with disabilities in 18 and 59 who are living in the community. So you see we've got a lot of folks at the table. And as I mentioned earlier, we have really built upon the foundations of other partners and other grants, other funds, other projects that are happening in Illinois. Because one grant can't do it all, whether it's it for the time you're funded, but certainly after the grant is over. So it's really important to us to think strategically in terms of you know, what pieces of the pie is realistic for us to focus on and what other pieces can best be of course. And the relationship that have been built through our work have been phenomenal. It really has helped us. For example, the arrest grant, um, where they can focus on law enforcement and uh, first responders through our Illinois Imagines grant that really was the scope was so wide already that the tap into law enforcement was really um, not in the best interest of the overall grant. And so our partner, the Illinois Family Violence Training Council, they were already, that's their expertise, that's their lens. So they wrote into their arrest grant 
responding to violence against people with disabilities. That's just an example of how you can partner groups and projects together. We have a state planning team. Um, we are way past the planning stage. We definitely have um, continued with that group that meets at a minimum on a monthly basis to really look at I think I'm an ICM six months. Whoever she is, because you know how they get when they get too wild, rather. Right? Or whoever she is, or whoever she is, I just don't want to talk to her no more. Hi, everyone. We're having a little bit of feedback, so we're just trying to mitigate that, and we will be back in one second. Teresa, it looks like you are back on. Okay, great. And so um, the local and state partnership is really an important piece because I think where we get some of our best ideas and the practice is really uh, what's important at the local level, um, we, we have to have that. And they give us direction. We've had 33 teams across the state that have helped inform the state work. Likewise, the state team is so important because we can change some public policies. We can change our own administrative codes and make it easier for our rape crisis centers and our disability service providers to, to um, be responsive, to be proactive even. And then it is an internal-external partnership. So it's, it's, it's the state, but it's also um, lots of other folks that have come to the table. The process, as Amy talked about in those, that early part of the grant um, is a planning process that then you know, kind of paints the way for implementation. So during that planning process, we did a needs assessment so we could understand you know, what is it that gets in the way of good services and the best types of supports. And, and Amy talked about many of those barriers that, that are common. We created a vision together. And I can't stress how important visioning and building a team are to the project. It's more than just growing old together at meetings. I mean, we really um, have gotten to know each other, to understand, respect, even disagree with each other, um, and, and do that in a way that um, good change happens. I was left off talking about the process, and the needs assessment was certainly something that guided our path. And, and the two really key areas that we discovered um, was that connections and readiness, uh, meaning you know, how connected are victims with disabilities to rape crisis centers, and how connected are rape crisis centers to disability service providers, et cetera. And, and we saw that that was an area that we really needed to pay attention to. We also needed to look at the readiness of staff, how comfortable were staff, you know, how, how confident were staff, and that goes way beyond being trained, but really developing relationships with self-advocates. We looked at policies and practices, and, and we found many places where there were seasoned staff that did an awesome job and the practice was smooth, but it wasn't directed by policy. So we've done some work in that area as well to make sure that we have sample policies that help guide the work. Um, so th this visual should just give an idea of what our cornerstones are, or our capstones are to the project. It's, it's about systems change. It's not a, a one-time thing or um, it really is looking at what are the parts of the system that need to be changed in order to, to change the experience of the survivor. Self-advocates are a key um, cornerstone of our project. And as I mentioned previously, they've been involved at every level, if on the public policy committee, co-chairs of local teams, um, players on the state planning team, regional trainers, all of those things. Um, saturation basically refers to the fact that it's not just about the individual champions around the table, but taking it back to the organization. Um, and sustainability, what's going to happen once the, the grant is over, and even how to, to expand it within the terms of the grant itself. These are our four core components, uh, a collaborative model, not just at the state level, but uh, across our 33 teams um, that would include uh, kind of a multidisciplinary approach, you know, from victim services, disability su survivors, self-advocates, adult protective service, all those things. Um, how responsive? are the rape crisis centers, and so we did reviews across the state. Outreach and education, which Amy mentioned as being one of the things that is often a challenge or barrier, and administrative supports. You know, what are things that the state needs to do in order to, to change things to make it easier for uh, providers as well as survivors with disabilities. So this gives you an idea of who all is a, a piece of the collaborative model. So these folks were brought together and we worked with them intentionally to help them identify the issues at the local level that um, affected the experience. We looked at responsiveness, um, as I mentioned, doing 
doing on-site reviews at every single rape crisis center in the state. And that was a very time-intensive effort, but one that was very, very important. We did those reviews as well with disability service providers, not all of the disability service providers across the state, but certainly um, we created the tools so that they could continue this work themselves. Um, and then the, the next piece of our work um, was outreach and, and just sharing uh, pictures here of some of our self-advocates that have been involved in the education. Um, whenever possible, we have self-advocates that are co-facilitating the education efforts. They know best where um, the language, they know best the concerns and issues, and they um, have contacts with disability service providers. So a peer-to-peer -peer approach is very important to us. Um, we've included, of course, also disability service providers and uh, sexual assault or rape crisis centers and have developed a host of materials. Administrative supports, this is just to give you an idea of how comprehensive our, our statewide um, public policy committee is. And some of the strategies that committee has used is looking at service standards. Like, for example, the, the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault has service standards that all rape crisis centers in the state follow. So we went back and looked at, you know, is there more specific language that is needed for um, supporting survivors with disabilities? Um, we looked at the 40-hour mandatory training for rape crisis centers and um, have over the years improved and continue to enhance that. Right now we're working on developing counselor materials. Um, we never want to hear that we can't work with so-and-so because they don't communicate well or they're not going to get anything out of counseling. Never a good answer. And so we're really uh, continue to, to create more and more tools to help counselors um, as they support and respond to survivors with disabilities. Administrative rules and statutes, just one quick example. In Illinois for years, um, uh, an individual, an adult with a disability who had a guardian could not have a rape kit done without guardian consent. And of course, there's lots of good reasons why that um, didn't work well and limited that service and uh, impacted justice. And so we changed that. And so now um, an adult with a disability that has a guardian does not have to have guardian consent in order to have a rape kit done. So that's, that's the type of thing that I'm talking about. Um, I encourage you to go to our website. We're continually posting new materials. We have a monthly webinar. We have monthly newsletters, um, resources that have been created. Uh, right now we're having spotlights on uh, self-advocates. Again, that really goes well with our, our, our core value. Uh, the toolkits that you saw on the preceding page, to give you an idea, um, this is what's contained in it, an overview guide which focuses on how to collaborate across systems, um, kind of a 101 for disability service providers and a 101 for rape crisis centers on, on how to address sexual violence against people with disabilities, and then a 19-lesson education guide, outreach materials, so that way you know uh, materials have been adapted in ways that they're most well-received by people with a variety of disabilities as well as the deaf community, and a multimedia uh, packet which would include um, the, the video that was created at the conference that I mentioned earlier. The list goes on. We, we kept, um, you know, adding things as we heard, you know, parents and guardians need to be involved. Of course, they can be one of the best support systems. The empowerment guide um, was developed by and for self-advocates so they could create empowerment groups in their own communities. Um, so this gives you an idea of what's available. Again, I just encourage you to go to the website or to follow up with me afterwards to, to uh, access these materials. We're happy to share them um, with other states, with other projects. Um, and I guess I want to rest on this is, you know, uh, even 12 years into this, um, we're finding that, you know, the more that the more that we do, the more that needs to be done. You know, this journey is just beginning. The more we change, the more we know needs to be changed. And, and that's not depressing. That's actually very exciting because we know we're making progress, but we desire to do so much more. And we just look at it at every, every time we get together for a state planning team meeting and say, you know, just imagine the possibilities. What else could we be doing? So it's exciting work, it's important work, and I encourage you to join our journey. So I'm going to pass it along. I believe Kristen um, is, is the next grantee speaking. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, I am Kristen Henry with Disability Rights Ohio, which is the protection and advocacy system for the state of Ohio. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the protection and advocacy system, how you can work with them in your state if you're not already doing so, 
and um, some examples of the work that we've done for people with disabilities who are victims of crime in our state. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the protection and advocacy system, you heard a little, about, a little bit about it earlier in the webinar. But um, to give you a little more information, federal law requires each state and territory to designate an organization that will protect and advocate the rights of people with disabilities. Um, each state is required to have either an independent state agency or a nonprofit. My agency is a nonprofit. Um, the protection and advocacy system covers all types of disabilities, um, people with developmental disabilities, people with mental illness, and people with other types of physical or mental impairments. Um, and each agency, even though we have similar missions to protect and advocate for people with disabilities, uh, we set our own annual priorities. And that's where you can kind of see where maybe some of the work you're doing is connected to some of the work that the protection and advocacy system does. Abuse and neglect are always going to be um, very high priorities for the protection and advocacy system because it's one of our core missions. Um, but there are other areas of non-discrimination that each agency addresses a little bit differently. The protection and advocacy system also has very unique access authority where we can go into facilities or service providers and um, talk to the people who are receiving services there. We can investigate claims of abuse or neglect. We can monitor even when we don't have uh, complaints of abuse or neglect. And um, in some cases, we can look at records to see what's been going on. So those are ways that the protection and advocacy system might have kind of a unique role or um, unique things that they can do in similar situations to issues that you're working on. So now I'd like to give you some examples of work that we've done and kind of how some of our protection and advocacy what? work um, evolved into specific work for crime victims. Um, as I said, the core mission of the protection and advocacy system is um, protecting people from abuse and neglect and investigating those types of complaints. So um, we have been doing that work for a very long time, and as we do those kinds of investigations, we try to identify systemic issues and find ways of addressing those, not just for one individual. Um, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a lot of comments coming through that people can't hear me. I've got my hand set up, but I'm also hearing something in the background too, so I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to kind of try to keep talking as loudly as I can. Um, so as we were doing this kind of investigation, we noticed a particular pattern of complaints coming in involving sexual abuse of adults with developmental disabilities. And we saw um, just some similarities in these cases, um, both in the, the circumstances where this abuse was occurring and then how they were handled. Um, we saw that it was very rare for these abuse claims to be substantiated, for there to be essentially proof that something had happened, let alone for things to be prosecuted to an actual conviction of the abuser. Um, so what we decided to do was to raise awareness about um, these issues. And so again, we wanted to bring to the forefront some of the information you've heard earlier in this presentation about the prevalence of abuse against people with developmental disabilities, about uh, the vulnerability factors, and some things that we could do in our state to address that. So two years ago, we created a three-part report on sexual abuse of adults with developmental disabilities. Part one was about contributing factors to vulnerability and abuse. Um, and like I said, that's things you heard from a prior presenter about dependency, isolation, lack of education, assumptions that are wrong about people with developmental disabilities. Um, and then into part two, we went into the problems with support services, um, the idea of a credibility bias, the lack of community involvement, the fact that some services are inaccessible to people based on their disability. And then in part three, we really hit the criminal justice part of it, um, the fact that crime is underreported, that um, at least in our state and I believe nationally, there's a serious lack of forensic interviewing resources. Many adults in our system are sent to child advocacy centers, um, and they recognize that that's not really an appropriate place, but 
the thought, I guess, is that um, it's better to have a slightly better interview experience, even though it's really not tailored to this person's needs. Um, there's bias issues with law enforcement, prosecutors who don't want to prosecute because they think the case might be unsuccessful and hurt their success rate. Um, we also address the lack of abuser registries consistently um, in our state because um, we have part of a system where people who are found to have committed abuse can be prohibited from being providers, but those are system specific and are not um, don't bar people from switching systems and um, being prohibited in those situations too. Um, so we address that as well as the need for more thorough background checks so that people who have actually, um, in the rare cases that are prosecuted and convicted, that um, people don't have the opportunity to continue to prey on, on vulnerable clients. Um, so our um, our report was very well received and happened to have just some very good timing that we were very grateful for. Um, the series of reports got the attention of our state attorney general, which is our state grantee for VOCA funds, um, in, at the same time that VOCA funds were significantly being increased. And um, we, um, our state was already planning to focus on underserved populations like people with disabilities with those increased funds. Um, our reports were released shortly before our statewide victim services conference called Two Days in May, and self-advocates who had um, reported experiencing sexual abuse were invited to participate in that conference. And um, as a result, the Attorney General created a new task force to um, address issues specifically to crime victims with disabilities. Um, and as a result of that report, it also um, led to us applying for and receiving VOCA funds to um, address crime victimization of people with disabilities in a more specific way. So we've been able for the past couple years to combine our expertise as the protection and advocacy system working with people with disabilities to um, both address disability specific issues for crime victims and also to um, increase their access to services from other providers and the criminal justice system. So as a VOCA subgrantee, we have been focusing on ensuring that crime victims have an equal access to the services that are available to them and the criminal justice system. So we've been able to take that disability expertise and partner with victim services agencies and other advocates to really um, improve the capacity for people with disabilities in our state. Um, we also made it a really um, specific priority of ours to educate crime victims about their rights. We did public presentations to people in the disability community to help them understand that abuse, which they hear about a lot, report abuse. This is an abuse investigation. Abuse is a crime, and so it should also be reported to the police. You should also have these rights. You can go to your victim services agency. Um, we wanted to make sure that that connection was made. And we also created publications that are specific to disability issues um, about how people can um, make sure that they are getting interpreters or getting access to their assistive technology, for example, um, as they're accessing crime victim services or going through the criminal justice system. Um, we've also reached out to providers and prosecutors and law enforcement about their responsibilities. We've done presentations about effective communication, reasonable modifications, and, and other requirements that um, come through the ADA or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and perhaps most importantly, we're collaborating with those other providers so that we can all be meeting the victim's needs. We do have staff that have experience with victim services and, and being advocates, um, but our general expertise is in working with people with disabilities. So um, that's why we like to partner so that we can use the victim services agencies, their expertise and our expertise together. And then um, we also have done just a serious amount of outreach so that people know what services are available, know what accommodations are available, and know how to reach us and how to ask for um, what they're entitled to from other systems or providers. 
um, in all of our work, but especially in this project, uh, we really prioritize collaborating with self-advocates. We want to involve, empower, and support self-advocates in everything that we do. Um, it's not our job just to act on other people's behalf. We want to um, help people understand what their rights are so they can also advocate for themselves. Um, we do not treat self-advocates like volunteers. We contract with them. We provide them with um, compensation for the work that they do with us. Um, one of the priorities we have is having self-advocates review some of our publications because as an attorney or as um, an advocate, I may use jargon, I may use phrasing that makes sense to me because I have experience in the system, but as someone who's coming um, maybe has never tried to access these services before, they're not familiar with that jargon, they're not familiar with this kind of wording, or it may be interpreted differently. And so we use self-advocates to review those publications and tell us, do they make sense? Are they communicating what we want them to communicate? For our presentations to people in the disability community um, about making that connection between abuse and crime victimization, um, the, pri the primary part of that presentation was done by self-advocates from one of our statewide self-advocate agencies. Um, they walked through and gave examples of types of abuse so that people had concrete um, ways of connecting that to what they had seen, heard, or experienced themselves. Um, we also try to connect self-advocates with the state and local agencies. So if someone calls us and asks us to do a presentation or to um, participate in a work group or something like that, we try to connect them with the self-advocates so that people can be speaking for themselves about um, how the services should be changed or uh, what problems need to be addressed. So if you are interested in working more with your state's protection and advocacy system, um, there are, I know, four states at least that currently receive VOCA funds, but it's a pretty new thing. Um, Disability Rights Ohio, which is where I am, Disability Rights Wisconsin, Disability Rights Iowa, I believe, and Disability Rights Network of Pennsylvania. So if you're in any of those states, I would certainly recommend that you reach out to your um, to your protection and advocacy system, and on my last slide, there's a link to a map of how you can um, find which agency is your protection and advocacy system. But even if your agency is not doing specific victim of crime work, they are serving victims of abuse, and so that's the same group of people. Um, you could check on their website for what their priorities are to get a better understanding of what their um, what their priorities, how they match, how they're common with your agency's priorities. And I highly recommend doing cross trainings, having their disability experts train your staff on how to work with people with disabilities and have your staff train their staff on how to work with um, crime victims um, because sometimes those techniques or those tips are not the same. Um, they may also be able to share disability-related resources. Uh, again, on my resource page at the end of my presentation, I have um, a particularly good link from the Department of Labor, just general tips about communicating and interacting with people with disabilities. Um, your protection and advocacy system may also do legal consultations or what we call technical assistance. So. Um, if a provider calls us and wants to know how they can accommodate someone or wants to tell us that you know, their um, local prosecutor is saying that they can't use an interpreter in the courtroom or something like that, uh, we can provide them with information about disability law, about crime victim rights, and um, they can use that to advocate for their own clients. Or if it's beyond uh, the referring provider's capability to do the advocacy themselves, uh, we can take direct referrals or requests from assistance for someone else's client, and then we can work with that person directly based on whatever they'd like us to do. So that's a pretty wide range of ways that you could um, collaborate or directly represent people um, who may have a disability that you're working with. So on this last slide, I've got a couple resources. The first one is a connection to our website. Um, we have um, some of the publications I talked about, including our series of reports, so I'd encourage you to take a look at those. 
Um, if you want to identify which agency in your state is the protection and advocacy system, that's the second link, um, which goes to our national organization, the National Disability Rights Network. And then finally is the publication from the Department of Labor that I just mentioned that gives you just some really helpful tips on working with people with disabilities. So thank you all for um, participating in this webinar. And I am going to turn it over to the representative from the USED. Hi, thank you, Kristen. This is Pam O'Brien from Pro, uh, Program Specialist at AIDD uh, at ACL. And um, I will give a brief uh, overview of the USEDs. They played key roles in every major disability initiative over the past four decades. They run model, diagnostic, clinical, and demonstration programs that serve over 200,000 people with disabilities each year. Uh, USEDs are currently implementing projects in areas of importance to people with DD, including the area, today's area of emphasis on sexual assault and abuse prevention, dating and domestic violence prevention, and survivor empowerment. Uh, USEDs across the U.S. and the territories are offering training and technical assistance on today's topic to people with DD and their families, service providers, uh, emergency preparedness trainers, shelters, group homes, clinicians, and law enforcement, including the Illinois USED, whose work we're highlighting today. In 2012, the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center and the Chicago Coalition Against Sexual Abuse of Children with Disabilities requested that the Illinois USED provide therapeutic services for children with DD who had been sexually abused. Susan Kahn is a licensed clinical counselor with the Illinois USED Family Clinics. She began working with the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center and Coalition to address disparity in trauma intervention services available to children with DD by training trauma and disability clinicians and agencies in the Chicago area and eventually around the country. Khan received training in forensic interviewing from the National Children's Advocacy Center and she's worked with agencies involved in Illinois' pilot program on short-term stabilization housing for adults with DD in crisis, and has created trauma-informed environments and behavior plans. Khan believes the key to improving safety from sexual abuse for individuals with DD is collaboration with the support and involvement of agencies like the ones here today she hopes to see these efforts and collaboration expand even further. It is my privilege to introduce to you Susan Kahn. Hi, this is Susan. Um, and I, I, I want to start by saying how excited and grateful I am that this work is being highlighted today um, from all of these groups. Um, it, it's been I think, as all of us know, kind of a long haul, bringing awareness to the um, to the impact of sexual abuse and sexual assault on individuals with developmental disability and the struggles that have occurred in accessing appropriate services, interventions, and investigations. Um, for me, as Pam mentioned before, I, I think that the 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 greatest impact that we can have with regard to establishing uh, better services and better access to all elements um, of care and investigation around the issues is collaboration. For too long, uh, the disability community and uh, trauma communities have acted in silos. And I think that, you know, breaking down silos has become kind of a buzzword in, in a lot of areas. I think it's particularly appropriate in this case. You know, for uh, the longest time, what we heard from trauma providers was, well, I do trauma. That's, that's a lot. It's, it's, it's already overwhelming. I can't do disability, too. And we've heard from disability providers the same thing. I do disability. That can be very overwhelming. It's too much. I can't do trauma, too. But one thing we know for sure is that if people are working in the area of trauma, they're working with people with disabilities. We saw earlier the statistics around 
challenges for survivors of sexual assault with regard to access and awareness and bias on the part of investigators, uh, lack of education around healthy sexuality, and the lack of a victim-centered response. If you're, people who are doing trauma are working with people with disabilities, people who are doing disability work, well, you know you're working with trauma. We've seen the statistics in that regard, too. So first, I want to put the clinic and some of our work into the context of the USED. Um, the USED at, at UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, is part of the Institute on Disability and Human Development, or, well, the Institute on Disability and Human Development is the uh, research and community service arm of the USED for Illinois. Uh, we are part of the Department on Disability and Human Development, which then the IDHD uh, involves a lot of different groups, all of which you'll note just by some of the titles involve a lot of collaborative work within uh, the community. And I think that that, that that is the model that the disability clinics have has grown up out of. Our clinics provide direct services in terms of um, therapeutic care, diagnostics, but also a lot of family support. Um, and advocacy and individual support and advocacy within community services. The problem that we're facing is the extraordinary risk that children with disabilities are at for sexual abuse. Um, I think that those of us who have worked in the area of disabilities have long been aware that people with disabilities and the people who, who we work with have this long-standing um, and disproportionate experience of trauma and abuse. Um, here at IDHD, there's been a historical focus on um, healthy sexuality and disability through our consortium on sexuality and disability. What, the way that we became involved in issues related to sexual abuse of children, as Pam mentioned, was our, the collaboration that formed in 2012 between um, the Disabilities Clinic here, the Family Clinic, and the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center through the Coalition Against Sexual Assault of Children with Disabilities. That coalition formed, or our involvement with the coalition began as the, there was sort of a growing awareness among clinicians here about the, the disparate impact uh, on our clients of um, trauma and sexual abuse. For me, that all became particularly um, urgent when I was working with a 54-year-old man who had been in therapy for 20 years for anxiety and sleep disturbance. And in the context of an intake interview with him, he shared a story of just extraordinary abuse at the age of 12. Um, when he finished telling this story, which, was, which really was, was pretty horrific, he kind of sighed and he said, well, I've never told anybody that before. And we were shocked. And we said, well, why didn't you tell anybody? And he said, well, nobody ever asked. That sort of, for me, really captured so much of the problem that we face. Um, coincidentally, and so many things in life happen by coincidence, around the same time we received an email from the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center asking that we become involved in the Coalition Against Sexual Abuse of Children with Disabilities. The coalition um, began probably 30 years ago um, as a, a small group of, of disability providers they took it upon themselves to, to try to bring awareness around the issue to agencies and providers in the Chicago area. In 2011, that um, coalition was taken up by the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center and expanded to involve a large variety of both disability and trauma providers. Uh, let's see. These are some of the groups who are currently involved. And you can see that they involve both, uh, we have members both from the disability community but also from the trauma community. We meet quarterly uh, to work on awareness, training, um, around issues from both sides of the aisle. It's that, it's that coalition approach the, that has been so effective in creating um, 
better services and better awareness for children in the Chicago area. The goals of, of um, the coalition are fourfold. The primary goal is to increase public awareness of the vulner vulnerability to sexual abuse of children with disability. I think awareness is everything. This uh, program today, I think, is emblematic of the increasing awareness generally of the problem. And for that uh, growing awareness, could not be more grateful. Uh, number two is increase access to mental health services for children with disabilities. Uh, the uh, Chicago Children's Advocacy Center provides mental health services to children who come through uh, who have experienced sexual abuse, but they have not, they did not historically have a lot of training around the issue of um, working with children with disabilities. This coalition, one of the primary goals was to increase uh, training for both trauma providers around working with children with disabilities, but also for disability providers around working with children who have disabilities. Um, the goal is that capacity building has to happen in both directions. We also, a big emphasis is on increasing uh, prevention efforts around sexual abuse of children. Um, that has to take place not only in both the trauma community and the disability community, but across all of our communities, right? We, we need to increase prevention efforts in the schools, in the homes, in our communities. And a lot of work has been done in that area. The fourth area is improving the knowledge and expertise of professionals who are first responders. Working on improving investigations for uh, cases that involve children with disabilities has been, um, it's been a, honestly, it's been a challenge. But that too has improved, and for the what makes me sort of most grateful in that area is the increasing willingness of investigators to attend trainings and to take a, a specific interest in uh, improving their working knowledge of um, children with disabilities and the impact of trauma on those children, um, and also working around. Um, the end goal of investigations, maybe sometimes changing that focus from prosecution to safety for the children. We can't always get a prosecution, but we should be able to improve safety. With regard to public awareness, UIC and um, CASA CD, the coalition, have done a tremendous amount of work. We've done dozens and dozens of trainings on prevention of sexual abuse with children with, of children with disabilities. Those trainings we've done for parent groups, provider groups, schools. Uh, very recently, I was able to, to do a training on trauma-informed environments that involved a lot of talk about prevention because I think prevention is a um, primary tool in creating a trauma-informed environment. The, uh, uh, that was for DCFS. Um, DCFS has an annual conference for uh, the caseworkers who work in adoption, and we were able to provide a day-long training for them on trauma-informed environments, including prevention. We provide trainings on internet safety and disability, a, a growing and scary element of vulnerability for our population, and as I mentioned before, creating trauma-informed environments. Um, those. What we, we were able to provide webinars, workshops, we talked to parent groups, we work with disability providers, trauma providers, um, first responders, child protection agencies, and also medical providers. In terms of capacity building, we've also had some pretty good success in the Chicago area. Again, that always involves training in both directions, from trauma providers to disability providers and from disability providers to trauma providers. Um, some of the trainings that, that we've done are creating toolboxes for trauma intervention for children with disabilities, trainings and best practices in trauma, um, and also trauma-informed environments and trauma-informed behavior planning, which for me is a, I, I consider that to be a really essential element of creating a trauma-informed environment. Uh, one thing that we've noticed is that the sort of as a society, we 
work with children with disabilities primarily on the basis of behavior plans. You know, if they are exhibiting a behavior that typically the behavior, it may be disruptive to them, but more importantly, it's disruptive to the people around them or annoying to the people around them, our children seem to end up on, a, on behavior plans at a disproportionate rate. Those behavior plans um, are not necessarily informed, trauma-informed. Uh, what we know particularly um, when you look at the statistics, with regard to abuse of children with disabilities, we, we can guess that so many of those behaviors are stemming from trauma. Uh, if the behavior plans are not trauma-informed, we're not going to have good success with those behavior plans. So we've done a lot of training around that area uh, with disability providers and also with um, BCBAs. Another, uh, the, the other direction is that we have to have trauma training for providers in the disability community. Um, the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center has done a, a fabulous job in that regard. Uh, they provide case consultation for uh, disability providers who agree to see children who have experienced trauma who are taking referrals from them, um, and they, they'll provide case consultation. I personally was lucky enough to be able to run down the street to their office once a week to get supervision on, on all of my cases when I was first learning the trauma model. Um, in addition, they have a, another coalition, which they call PATH, which I'm not going to remember off the top of my head um, what that stands for. But th that's a group of all of the providers who accept services, accept referrals from them for mental health services for children who've experienced sexual abuse. Um, that includes the disability providers from CASA CD. They provide these um, trainings, these regular trainings on a variety of trauma interventions. And uh, we're, as members of the coalition, uh, disability providers are able to access those trainings for free. In terms of investigation, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we, I feel like we've made some significant progress in that area. One thing that I notice is that the, uh, some of the people at the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center have looked at this as the, the slow movement in that area as challenging. And I point out that in disability, things do tend to move at a glacial pace. But we've been able to provide training and consultation, direct con case consultation as well, for all of the investigators, the medical team, and the family advocates at the, at the uh, advocacy center. I want to be aware of time here because I recognize that we're coming to the end of our, of, of our uh, scheduled time, so I'm going to scoot ahead. These are some of the um, places where we've been able to share a lot of our work. Um, and, and our model. We've been able to present and um, provide consultation across the country now, um, including we've presented several times now at the International Child Abuse Symposium, and one thing we notice is an increasing audience there, um, which has been fabulous. The outcomes that, we're, that we've accomplished, public awareness has grown substantially, particularly in the Chicago area. Uh, five years ago, I did a training on prevention of sexual abuse that nobody showed up to. Uh, recently, I've done trainings that have had hundreds of people. And the fact that we have so many people on the line today, I think, is emblematic of the growing awareness. <laughs> Capacity building has been, we've been effective in that area. The number of providers in the community that who are now working comfortably with children with disabilities who've experienced sexual abuse has grown widely. And then in investigation, as I keep mentioning, that is improving. Um, and that's a hard nut, but, but that's improving. Some of the things that we'd like to see come out of this are um, an exp expansion of coalitions across the country. You know, we have a model that works here. We'd be happy to share how, how we accomplish that with anybody who would be interested. Um, we'd like to see, um, we'd like to identify more opportunities. We're happy to become involved. If there are, are other groups out there who are working, we'd love to, to expand our own knowledge and, and involvement across the country. Um, and again, we're, we would welcome any outreach from listeners who have an interest or have a project that they would like collaboration on. Um, in terms of resources, 
I have some resources listed here. AUCD recently uh, provided a um, webinar on the road to recovery supporting children with IDD who have experienced trauma. And the National Children's, uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has a toolkit, which I believe that some of the uh, people involved in the webinar helped create, a, a toolkit for working with children with disabilities. So these are some of the um, uh, resources that are out there, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions um, or uh, requests for consultation as, as needed from anybody who's listening. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan and Kristen and Teresa, for your discussion of the tremendous work that you're doing and for taking time to share with us today. Uh, before we go into a couple minutes for Q&A, um, please do send us, by the way, any questions via chat box if you have them. Uh, we're unable to answer those questions in a bit of time now. Um, we will do our best to follow up with you um, with the resources and materials from the presentation. Some of the resources that we've highlighted here we'd just like to share with you are um, some products that are from uh, National Resource Centers supported by the Office on Violence Against Women and also um, a resource by uh, Disability Rights Ohio. Um, one of the questions did ask about primary prevention and in addition to the importance of teaching persons with disabilities early on about healthy relationships as one means of primary prevention, I think that this resource on Know Your Rights About Sexual Abuse from Disability Rights Ohio is another uh, good way to start a dialogue uh, with persons with disabilities about um, what's a violation of their personal uh, safety and dignity um, and, and what types of responses they have a right to um, in the event that uh, they do experience abuse. I am going to um, see if any of our presenters uh, would like to answer uh, some of the questions that were raised, which are, um, what about responding to sexual violence that is perpetrated um, by another person with a disability, um, perhaps in a in an assisted living facility? Um, and then also, um, similarly, if a perpetration um, is made by a social worker in a, in a, in a facility. Um, perhaps perhaps uh, one of our presenters would like to take one of those questions. This is Teresa. Oh, wonderful, Teresa. <laughs> um, the, the second part of the question on if it is a social worker or staff, um, in Illinois we have two different types of mandatory reporting. One involves if it is either an employee of one of the DHS funded uh, disability service providers or um, the agency did not uh, protect the individual. There was a violation of their own policy where someone was supposed to be supervised, that type of thing. Um, and so that would report, in, that would um, result in within four hours, you know, once the agency is aware of it, they have to report to the Office of the Inspector General, which is housed within the Department of Human Services, and um, and then it would be investigated. You know, if it is founded, it goes into the healthcare workers registry, so that way um, any, any person in the public can look that up and, and certainly a potential employer will have that information. Um, the downside is, it, you know, it is a legal process and so um, uh, an accused employee, um, you know, even one that, uh, that's founded can appeal the decision and that will delay um, the information being put in the, the registry. Um, you know, that's part of what we've worked on in terms of giving sample policies to organizations so they'll have some guidance beyond the, you know, pick up the phone and call within four 
hours, but you know, um, there, it's so important to not go down that route and leave the survivor hanging. You know, how to how to give um, support, how to be present when the person is reporting. Um, you know, it doesn't take away from the fact that that phone call is going to need to be made, but um, that should not be at the expense of providing the immediate support. Um, and um, you know, and, and that means having it victim centered. So it might be the individual that makes the phone call to OIG. It might be um, having comfort items with them, uh, a comfort person with them, um, hooking them up with a victim service agency or other supports that they that they would like. Um, so that's that's kind of the package. You know, there are sample policies that we're willing to share. Um, and in terms of, and the same thing would be true uh, if it is a, another person with a disability. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes. Um, you know, there there isn't another service provider in the area, and if both individuals, you know, uh, would benefit from whether it be a day program or residential, um, it becomes much more difficult to um, to do that. But of course, it should be the victims' needs that are, are the first priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is Amy. Can I just uh, jump in as well? I, uh, follow up on what you were saying. I think that um, you know a, a lot of our grantees actually um, address that that question because it comes up quite um, uh, often. Um, so that's one of the the technical assistance um, that our TA provider provides, which I did not mention um, earlier, but it's the Vera Institute of Justice, and um, they have created a website with all kinds of resources. But one of the things. Um, uh, on that website, and I'll put it up in the chat so everyone can have that, is where all of the grantees are um, that, we have uh, that we have supported. So they are state-focused projects like Teresa, but they're also um, small local service uh, projects doing the direct services. And so I think that um, you know, if you happen to have, if you want to contact Vera directly, um, they are more than um, able to answer your questions, and certainly if you want to contact um, a grantee that we've supported in the past, that also um, is an option. So I will put this in the chat for everyone, but um, I think these are all issues that probably lots of organizations are struggling with. Great. Thank you, Amy and Teresa. That was really good information, very thorough. A question uh, came in uh, about um, training our first responders uh, investigating sexual assault among survivors with developmental disabilities. Would anybody have comments on that question? This is Susan. Uh, what we've been able to do is work closely with the, um, the investigators at the Children's Advocacy Center who specialize in investigation of sexual assault of children with disabilities. That's uh, from the Chicago Police Department, Department of Children and Family Services, forensic interviewers, and also their medical staff. Um, in terms of what that training involves, is a, a lot of training around uh, disability awareness, um, and some of the, sort of the basics of interacting with people with disabilities. But in addition to that, we do a lot of training around communication uh, concerns. One of the biggest uh, roadblocks in an investigation is when the person who's experienced abuse um, is not able to tell the story of the abuse the way an investigator would like to hear it for prosecution. That is a, an ongoing challenge. And so we've done a lot of training around uh, sort of those language barriers, those communication barriers uh, involving children with disabilities. And that does seem to have helped. It's also changed sometimes the discussion, as I mentioned earlier, from, uh, from a, real, a, a complete focus on prosecution to we'd like to get a prosecution, but if we can't, at least we need to do a better job creating safety for the children involved. So uh, it, it, it's simply a matter of connecting your investigators with the disability groups that exist in their community and creating a collaborative relationship. Um, this is what we do here. We've had some success there, as I say. That this is the tough one, but, but we have definitely made some progress in that area. 
And this is Teresa. I'd like to add, and I'm typing a resource as well, um, the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, as a part of their arrest grant, developed model protocols for law enforcement and model protocols for prosecutors specifically on how to respond to violence against people with disabilities. So it covers domestic as well as sexual violence in those two audiences. If you go on the website, um, it also has all of the training tools. So the PowerPoints that go with doing the day-long training, um, as well as the handouts, etc. cetera. Um, that also includes uh, many toolkits that are available for other important groups like um, emergency medical services, 911 call operators, probation, and court services, which would include um, clerks as well as court security. So I'll put that in the chat box so you can look those up, download them, and um, adapt them uh, to, to fit uh, your state or your community. Fantastic. Thank you all. It's do one final question, um, which is uh, in response to several comments made in the chat box about um, the real challenges with accessing resources on this theme uh, for folks who are living in rural areas. And uh, if any of our speakers could talk about um, thoughts they have on outreach um, and partnerships between